in the studio of Megan Verner, who has a show on at the moment at the Mel Hop Gallery. And um, I thought it was a good opportunity to come and visit her in her space and talk a little bit about her work. Megan, thank you so much for letting us um, peek around your studio. Yeah, of course, I'm excited. Um, when we, if we think about um, your show, uh, Passing Time in the Desert, what is it about the isolated environments that you are um, presenting? What is it about them that really attracts you? Uh, well, I think it's, the, there's a lot, I think, to unpack with that, but I am from the desert. Um, I spent a lot of time in the desert growing up. We used to visit places like Death Valley every year um, as kids and go explore just out in this vast, you know, open area. Um, I really liked being able to see for long distances and have that vista where you can really place yourself within like this larger landscape. Um, you know, as I got older or whatever, went to graduate school. I lived in Iowa for three years, which was a very different landscape, but um, also kind of vast and open. It really made me start thinking about um, these kind of landscapes that people don't necessarily think of as having a lot to offer. Um, I heard that a lot growing up anyway, meeting people who said, you know, well, this is kind of just a barren, ugly landscape around here. Um, but for me, it really invites introspection because you don't have a lot of stimulation or a lot of um, things around you, you know. I tend to feel more claustrophobic in forests and not to say that when you're out in any kind of nature you can't feel this kind of connection and introspection with your your place in the the grand scheme of things but um the, the there were things about that emptiness that really drew me to the idea of um this internal landscape uh especially in reading about the Arctic and the types of mirages they would see there on the water and on these vast open snowy tundras and things like that. Um, that got me really thinking about this, this relationship of sort of our mind in relation to environment and where we are, how we perceive that. And you did a series of mirages. I can see a couple in mm -hmm. the studio here. Let me just zip over here. Where were these taken? So those were done in the Black Rock Desert. Um, I was on a residency there in 2016 uh, and just had the opportunity to spend two weeks out in the desert. And that was a place that I'd been to many times before, um, but I think having the time to be out there and to really explore that landscape. Um, are these some of the yeah, works from the Black Rock? These, these are the the playa um, pieces there. Those are actually cyanotypes that are bleached and toned. Um, just that incredible pattern. Um, and the, the mirages I made with um, double exposing Polaroid film essentially. Um, and then scanning it, I feel like the conditions were perfect that day because the sky had a quality to it that allowed these double exposures to create that kind of superimposed image that looks like the superior mirage that you often see on the desert. Um, yeah, there's this this excerpt from um, Barry Lopez's Arctic Dreams where he's talking about these maps that these early Arctic explorers made of completely made up um, mountain ranges and islands and things that they saw because mirages are actual optical you know verifiable things you can photograph things you can actually see um so they mapped out these places that didn't exist which just fascinated me <laughs> that's amazing yeah <laughs> um you have a, a mainly lens-based practice but you are very experimental with um your mediums when did that start oh uh so i learned like trained as a I, what i call you know a traditional photographer i learned in the dark room black and white photography and color photography um but i started getting really into video 
my later years in college. And I think that kind of led me down a path. Um, so I ended up going to graduate school in a program called Intermedia, which was kind of all the non-traditional genres of art, um, like performance art and installation art. So combining different media. Um, and I think coming from this, this, well, so I think it's twofold. That influenced me. And then I went into teaching digital photography after graduate school, which is very controlled. Um, with digital photography, you can control almost every aspect. And when I was an undergrad playing with photographic techniques, um, we would do, we learned how to do pinhole photography and I really loved instant film. And some of the draw for me for those techniques was not having control and having the medium that you don't have in the same way with straight digital photography where you have that control. Um, so I, I really, I, I had a chance to take a cyanotype class actually with Megan Reichenhoff and um, that led me down the path of cyanotypes and wanting to experiment with the ways that you can manipulate uh, those images. That happened just before I went to the Arctic actually. Um, I learned how to do all of that and started playing with cyanotypes extensively for like a year or two before I went on that trip. Um, and I think it's a combination of, yeah, just I wanted to have something that felt more like I was using my hands than just this machinery. And I I don't want it to sound like, because I love the camera, I think that it's not just a, a machine and, a, you know, it is a tool, but there's so much more to it than that. Um, but I do love that relationship with materials that I feel like I have with the digital transfers and the cyanotypes. Yeah, that actual physical tactile yeah. tactile processes is so important. Yeah. Um, I feel that as well. So at what point did you um, decide which processes um, you were going to use when you were on your residency in the Arctic? I imagine you had a very limited amount of things that you could take with you. Yeah. So I actually, I didn't, the only things that I took with me on that residency were my camera equipment. So my camera, my lenses, my audio recorder. Um, I took some fabric pieces, flags, essentially. I had a couple flags that I took with me. Um, one of them was a cyanotype flag, but I didn't take any cyanotype materials with me. Um, and I took some like watercolor paper and watercolor pencils and um, paintbrushes and that was the only thing I made postcards out of these of like the glacier scenes and those were things that I actually sent to people um, but what I really did on that trip was I gathered footage and images and just you know took it all in because it was it was a short time and we were on a ship so there wasn't a lot that I could bring with me um, so how many were on the ship there were I, I'm pretty sure there were 26 artists writers you know other creatives that were on there oh, that would have been amazing it was it was a crazy experience it was um, two weeks right yeah it was two weeks on the ship and then we had a little bit of time on either end in um, long european and it was during the summer solstice so it was light the whole time and the sun hardly moved the only real changes in light happened with the weather wow. yeah it was that's crazy, crazy. <laughs> so was everyone working at different times of the day or yeah, night? Yeah, I mean, they had us on a schedule, which was good, because there's no, you know, cues. There's no, you know, from the light. Um, so we, you know, got up, had breakfast every day. Then there was usually time when we got to go ashore, and we'd hike or wander, or you'd set up and do your thing if people were, some people were actually sketching in the landscape, or, you know, I filmed some of my flags and things like that. Um, and then, and there were dancers that were performing out there, which was quite surreal. Um, and then we'd have lunch and then we'd have afternoon activities where we could go out or people would work, you know, there was a common area on the ship and so people would be working. Um, but yeah, it was, it was bizarre not having those like cues from the light. I realized how, how in tune to the light I am and I thought I was going to really love having light like that all the time. And I did on a certain level, but it made me crazy. Like there's no, it feels manic. There's no. There's no downtime. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so um, how often at the moment are you able to get into your studio and practice? 
Well, so I have a full-time job. <laughs> so usually I'm in here. I try to come here once a week at the very least, um, but usually it's weekends, sometimes evenings that I'm in here. So it's not a whole lot of time. I hope to change that, but yeah. And, and so if you're only in here a couple of days a week, how, what is your process for getting right into working? I mean, can you get straight to it or do you have certain rituals or things that you have to do? <laughs> I know that a lot of artists yeah. have little things that they have to do before they yeah. can kind of get to work. So uh, that's a good question. I have discovered this about myself as an artist. Um, when I was in graduate school, it was, you know, you're expected to be productive 100% of the time pretty much and everybody else is doing the same thing. And so, you know, I put a lot of pressure on myself to be like that um, and then realize that is not how I work. So I have cycles um, and if I'm in the middle of projects that I'm really feeling momentum and excited about, it's very easy for me to step in here and just continue and keep working. Um, there are periods though where it's more like, you know, I come in here and I sit and I read or I research things and look at things or oftentimes I pick up old work and, you know, play with that and look at it and see if there's, you know, somewhere else to go with that. But that's, I feel like that's always how I'm led to new things is looking through some of the stuff I've done, but also like going into new environments and spaces and and doing that. But yeah, so I don't really have rituals. I don't listen to music really when I'm in here. I'm not that, that has never been sort of a thing that I do. But um, I think just coming to the studio and showing up, like having this dedicated space is so important for oh, me. Yes. Yeah. It's amazing. And look at this little beauty here. <laughs> it's just, I do, I'm kind of <laughs> drooling over this. I do try to print at least one thing every time I come in here. That's maybe the one That's ritual. That's great. You know, just to, Wow. get that going yeah and these are beautiful so these are cyanotypes they are you're saying yeah so they're you know i made negatives that i printed them with and they're normally that bright blue color cyanotypes but then they are bleached and toned um basically with tannic acid to give that brown color like the that's desert. almost the exact exact match to the desert mm -hmm. isn't it to the playa So Megan, I noticed that you have been working with kind of symbolic flags in quite a few of your different series. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that came came about? Sure. Yeah, I um, I don't even remember when I started this this series, but I did a series called Arbitrary Territories that um, what were basically flags for places that were meaningful to me that I considered sort of my places. Um, but it was kind of a commentary on this idea of claiming space and sort of the, the ridiculous nature of that, right? Like planting a flag and saying, this is mine. Mm -hmm. But also the, um, that idea of going out and, you know, photographing that some of the flags I actually so I made these flags that were specific to these places that were meaningful to me um, and I did a lot of research on vexillology which is the study of flags or flag language and oh, what is like it? that vexillology vexillology yeah um, I, <laughs> I know I got really into this <laughs> and so created symbols and things like that for these these places using specific colors and then I actually took the flags to those places and photograph them and it was kind of this you know idea of claiming space but poking fun at the idea but then thinking about how we internalize these spaces and so that's more of the the sort of claim of territory it's like a connection memory connection and things like that rather than this physical act of placing this flag um so that's how it started and then um jared stanley who's a writer and also an artist um approached me, we met sort of circumstantially actually at the Holland Project through um, letterpress stuff that I had there, you know, some of my printed stuff and started talking and um, uh, he, you know, sort of invited me to collaborate with him. And so we started thinking about um, flags and projects and we made this one series 
this series that started it, our collaborating together was um, a, gosh, um, the Aeolian Marsh was what we called it. And it was these series of flags that had language on them. So there was text that was sewn in and then also other symbology. Um, and we actually presented it at this eco-poetic concert and a conference, excuse me. And it was at this uh, marsh, this actual marsh in Oakland that Jared had grown up around. So it had meaning for him in that way, but we created these beautiful, what I, they were beautiful flags and really fun um, about the landscape and the species that lived there and things like that. And we did this one flag that was a white, almost all white flag. Um, it had text on it and the text was cut off on the top and bottom and um, I just kept referring to that flag as the surrender flag and I had done series before in my artwork about basically about meditation and like wallowing and daydreaming this idea of just letting go and that's when things happen creativity you know ideas come to you and um, so I was really really enamored by this idea of the surrender flag and surrender and so we did another series of flags together that were all white flags with text that were sort of the opposite the text on them were sort of the opposite of the meaning of surrender words like victorious like that's on this flag um and um things that, that? Yeah. Let's, let's have a look at that yeah things that you know it in t in more effort or denote more effort than or con out more effort, I should say, than surrender. Um, but the thing about the flags, and what I love about flags is that, you know, when it's not windy, they hang like this and you can't read them. And then when it is, they're kind of at the whim of the weather and then you can read them when they're fully, you know, out flapping like this. So um, in certain, you know, weather conditions, these were very easy to read. And then at certain other times, you can't read them at all. So no is it is it a kind of medieval shape of the flag? What does that have any kind of tail. <laughs> does that have any significance? You know, it it doesn't really. I think I was just drawn to this shape. So I designed all of the flags that we did, and this is my handwriting um, that's on them. But I think I was just drawn to that, especially because the way that it flaps in the wind, it creates this really neat mm -hmm. motion. So they're super subtle, really, aren't they? But what were the other? What were some of the other words that you um, that that were on the other flags? Hey, yeah, I think I'd have to look to see. So some of them were. I, there was something like, um, well, victorious, maybe outstanding, um, like defiant uh, or defying. I don't know if they were all ings or not. I, it's been a while since I've looked at all of these. I'm sorry. Um, have you, um, have you had them installed anywhere altogether or have they been single, like, yeah, single instances of, of planting a flag? What, what so the, the... these flags were all displayed together and so were the Aeolian Marsh ones. Um, the the arbitrary territories were installed separately in specific places but these were up at um, st mary's art center i think that's well and they were also installed at um, arts for all nevada during the literary crawl that nevada humanities puts on um a few years back um so yeah these have only ever been seen all together as a group okay yeah um Megan, um, thank you so much for letting us poke around in your studio. My last question is, um, what are you currently working on? So I had done a series of images that were sort of based on the Arctic work that I had done where I was doing digital transfers onto acrylic um, so to get that glow kind of of light and ice. Um, and I started experimenting with that on paper as well, and then combining that with cyanotype that I would sometimes manipulate ble with bleaching and toning and things like that. So I came up with this series of landscapes that were kind of these hybrid landscapes, and um, I call them kind of imagined landscapes because they're based on real landscapes, but then turned into this other thing. So here's an example, one of those that was a, um, more arctic looking with the glaciers and the, this part's the digital transfer and this part's the 
cyanotype part of it. Um, so you've you've put what cyanotype? fluids mm -hmm. what is it the ferrochloric mm -hmm. what is it what I is don't that know. stuff i can pull the bottles off the shelf there <laughs> um but you've painted it in a yeah. separate layer yeah so i did the digital transfer first this part and then i just painted this part of the paper with the cyanotype chemicals um and exposed that and then washed it um but I was really interested in the the way these landscapes were turning out. Um, these pieces are fairly small, and so I think I'm. What I want to do now is lead into larger work, playing with um, different images than what I used for this, but creating larger landscapes. Um, and I had an opportunity to do an installation in Las Vegas. Um, they have these windows at their city hall that are big, almost like storefront display windows. 14 feet high and I actually started printing on fabric and I used some of the imagery from that series the fading light shifting um, landscapes series and printed these huge rolls so they're 44 inches wide by these are just test strips obviously but um, 14 feet here's one that got messed up I don't know if you want to see it oh, see yeah. like, see all the crazy banding in it and it's kind of funky color but um they're they're these long long things so just, and this is with the backed the paper backed fabric so the fabric's actually kind of um translucent and these were hung so they were kind of layer together um, what was the name of that um of that project fading light shifting landscapes it's the same title as the series of images that i created um but I really like the, the physicality of the fabric, and so I'd love to create more installation work. Um, and also, like I said, just some larger pieces that combine these techniques, the digital transfer with the cyanotype. Um, so that's kind of where I'm headed next. And I, I had done those um, images from the Arctic that were on the acrylic and I think I'd like to experiment some more with transferring on the plexi because I just love the the look of that and the way that it it just creates this ethereal looking image I as you can see I like that because this is yeah, also the, semi-transparent yeah, you know, the way that it even reflects on the walls yeah yeah no, this is amazing yeah and you can see like if you know what you saw with the new the way that it kind of, you know, just it lets the light in, and if it's against a, a lighter background, it does these these just cool layering things. So, yeah, really. Oh well, that is really exciting. The colors in this are incredible. They've come up really nicely. All right. Well, I think that I've kept you long enough. So thank you so much yeah. for letting us uh, see your studio and hear what you are up to. Um, lately. Yeah, thank you.